That's mortalism, Patrick. <laughs> Bovcast. 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 This is the Bovcast, a podcast exploring Reformed theology through the works of Herman Bovink. Well, <laughs> well, we're just off to a great start here today. Welcome to another Bobcast. I am Andrew Smith, and I'm Caleb Castro. And, and Caleb is coming to Andrew you live is from. Coming to you upload. live from. You're coming. You're coming you're live coming from, a, from. I quit. <laughs> You took the words right out of my mouth, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> no, you look like you're coming live from, like, a closet. And you're coming live from in front of my face. That's true. Literally. We are it, having a rare interaction where we are recording with video for each other as we're speaking this. And Andrew has a backdrop, which is my face. Yeah, it's the uh, picture of his face with the big orange circle taken from our website. It's beautiful. Yeah, so it's almost like, you know, he's... It, it's almost dystopian. It'd be like, you know, 1984, the giant picture of the dictator blown up behind. The big Brother's everybody. watching. Yeah, only it's Caleb. Except it's more beautiful and sexy. <laughs> Can we say sexy on this show? I just did. All right. Well. And, uh, yes. We're going to get canceled. Well, and I'm coming at you from a something of a storage room slash room full of free books at my seminary. Anything good in there? Um, Not anymore. It's pretty picked over. There is uh, a copy of uh, the Allen translation of uh, Calvin's Institutes, just volume one. Uh, there's just volumes two. One and two of Hodge. Um, a huh. <laughs> couple Dutch books. Yeah. Some incomplete sets. <laughs> incomplete sets, theological journals, uh, etc. That's pretty fun in here, though, but it's nice and quiet. Fair enough. Fair enough. So we are in chapter 10 of The Wonderful Works of God. We've been talking about the Trinity, which hopefully we do better than talking about anything else. Yeah, Andrew. The the thing about talking about the Trinity is that you you make even a minor mistake and suddenly you're a heretic. So no pressure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no joke though. <laughs> it really is. It really is pretty. It, it can be kind of easy to to create a problem. So let's get going with this uh, lesson then. So the Trinity is kind of like uh, the three states of matter. Uh, think of water as a liquid. Or if it turns into a vapor like steam or solid like an ice cube. How about no? How about never? Why? What, what's wrong with that? Well, to quote uh, our Lutheran friend Hans Fein at <laughs> Lutheran Satire, that's mortalism, Patrick. <laughs> that's the second time someone has said that to me today. Well, I'm just you're kidding. in seminary. If you, <laughs> are you even in seminary if you don't hear that multiple times per day? That's actually a pretty accurate description of seminary. I suppose since Caleb has led us down this heretical path, uh, this would be a good time to maybe mention that anytime anybody wants to offer an analogy of the Trinity <laughs> uh, to a created thing, that they're wrong. Something's wrong with it. It won't work. Just, Just don't. You might have heard the three stages of matter one, like Caleb just used, or one I've heard before is like an egg, where you have an egg that has a shell and a yolk and a white, which that's partialism, Patrick. Or you get, uh, actually, I believe this is one that Augustine uses uh, regarding a source of light, the light itself that illuminates, and the flame or heat that comes off that light. Which, we like Augustine here. He was generally pretty good, but but just no. <laughs> just no. Well, but there are some things that can be said. Well, Bob Inc. is going to uh, take us down uh, the path of just some various biblical passages pointing towards the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, as we know, the word Trinity itself is not in Scripture. However, the entirety of Scripture does point to the doctrine itself, does teach the doctrine itself by good and necessary consequence through inferring 
uh, what is being said and stated. So uh, there's legitimate theological conclusions to be made here, evidencing God reveals himself as Trinity. Uh, last time we looked at uh, scripture's witness in the Old Testament regarding uh, Trinity. And now uh, Bobbing is going to be walking us through uh, those of the New Testament and then dealing with the topic of uh, the person of the Holy Spirit. So we have here, first off, uh, the Trinity and his involvement uh, in the Incarnation. Yep. <laughs> yep. Thank, and that's all we have uh, time for on Bobcast. No. <laughs> No, so Trinitarian activity in the Incarnation. Uh, the Incarnation is, along with creation, probably one of the most evident works of God in Scripture where you see a full Trinitarian action and participation going on where there is all three persons of the Trinity carrying out roles in that. So, for instance, with the Incarnation, we confess it's in the creeds as well as our confessions and catechisms, that Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit. You remember from, I think we mentioned this before, talking about creation, the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. as giving life. Um, so we have Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so there you have the Father who is, who is sending, and then the Son being sent, the Spirit uh, involved in conception. And then you also see this at Christ's baptism, you have, of course, the Son being baptized. You have the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And then you hear the voice of the Father saying, This is my Son with whom I am well pleased. So, again, a Trinitarian activity in the Incarnation. And what we get here, um, if you were listening to that last episode on the Trinity, what you get here is a fulfillment of, of various uh, things that were already revealed in the Old Testament, but as Andrew was saying, here you're getting them in the full picture. In other words, the Holy Spirit was already pointed at, uh, just as the Holy Spirit was already involved in and present in the redemptive history uh, occurring, unfolding in the Old Testament period. Well, here you get point blank, uh, very explicit uh, statements regarding the Holy Spirit, but likewise also of the second person of the Godhead, the Son, most explicitly made in uh, the incarnation. That's something that had really not be glossed over, that already you're seeing uh, persons of the Godhead evidenced in this consistent uh, economic working, this outworking of this one God. So he reveals himself already perfectly in these actions of incarnation in the baptism. And it's important, and we've said this before, but to maintain that this is an economic distinction. So we're talking about the distinction between God and his being, uh, ontological, versus God, the Trinity, and each of these persons in their actions, in what they do. Um, this also relates to something we talked about when we did our series on covenant theology, uh, when we talked about the covenant of redemption, and how this is fulfilling, this is executing an intra-Trinitarian covenant that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have entered into to carry out the redemption of a people. And you really want to think through the biblical statements uh, that are occurring here. You were referring a moment ago to um, Matthew chapter 3, for example, on the baptism. 317, right, where the Spirit descends as in the form of a dove. The Father says, this is my uh, beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this is, first of all, an astonishing thing in that God was silent for some 400 years of revelation. Okay, God has not made a pronouncement since the glory departed Israel, as you see prophesied in, uh, what is that, Ezekiel uh, 37. The first time that God explicitly speaks audibly since the, the cessation of the Old Testament uh, administration in its temple glory, its temple ministry, God is making an announcement of the son's appointment. He's validating the son for his mission of redemption. And he quotes uh, his own words in Psalm 2. It says, you are my son, right? Today I have become your father, uh, as well as Isaiah 42. Uh, this is my servant, my chosen one, whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit on him uh, and he will bring justice to the nations. 
So the statement here in Matthew 3.17 even are a combination of these two passages stating that Jesus Christ is of God. He is sent from God um, and that the Holy Spirit is poured out on him for the justice of the nations. This is the sort of reason that the Pharisees wanted to put him to death. Oh, he's claiming to be the son of God. Well, that's because God has announced it himself. He is of God. So what Bavink does next is he goes through each of the three persons and talks about them. So first he talks about the father. He writes on page 135, The father is therefore always the father, the first person. He from whom in the being of God, in the counsel of God, and in all the works of creation and providence, redemption and sanctification, the initiative proceeds. He gave the son to have life in himself and he sends out the spirit. He is the election and good pleasure. From him proceed the creation, providence, redemption and renewal. To him in a special sense, the kingdom and the power and the glory accrue. He particularly bears the name of God in distinction from the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Indeed, Christ himself as mediator calls him his father, not only, but also his God. So they're referencing Matthew 27, 46 and John 20, 17. And Christ is himself called the Christ of God. In a word, the first person of the divine being is the father because of him are all things. So we see here again in this economic relationship, this is not denoting any kind of eternal subordination, ontological subordination. But in terms of the relations between the persons, the father is the father and the son is the son. And so that that itself is the nature of the father and this person. For someone to be considered a father, that would imply that they have a son or a, a child, if you will. Okay, for, for, for someone to be a son, that would imply they have a father. Uh, we're speaking even in earthly terms, right? There, there must be some originator of sorts. In, in speaking of this language for this relationship between God the Father and God the Son, is because the, uh, as, as Andrew was saying, the Son is of the Father. That this, this is an eternal begetting. That that the the, the Son is eternally of the Father, uh, so to speak, of His bosom. Okay, that He uh, is eternally generated of Him. Uh, without beginning. So if God is to be eternal, then he must be eternally father. Those can't be separated. This is where we had said in those previous episodes, you can't uh, break off God's attributes into various parts uh, according to when they're they're convenient for description or whatever. If God is eternal in, in whatever God's attributes we're speaking of, then God must be eternally father. If he is eternally father, you must then have eternal son. For the son to be an eternal son, he must be eternally of the father. This isn't something uh, that can be minimalized. Their relationship as far as their divine essence with regards to deity, with regards to divinity, this is the one God, along with the Holy Spirit, as we'll uh, speak of in a moment, but distinguished according to this personal uh, see, this is where the language comes. Uh, we, we, there's, there's a natural reflex wanting to say personal being, uh, personal existence. But uh, in this manner, a uh, particular word that can rub us the wrong way, but is an accurate way of speaking, is saying a personal mode. That is not to confess modalism. Okay, God doesn't reveal himself in various modes at different points in time, shifting between Father, then to Son, then to Holy Spirit. But God does express himself by mode or manner, means of, a trifold person, as trifold subsistency is the word that would be used for this. This is where it gets thick and thick and thick into the muds, but the point in this being, the way that God reveals himself is ultimately through his work, through word and in, in deed. This is how we're able to make these differentiations, and yet at the same time, it's it's a theological distinction about his reality. God is one and three persons. So to describe this relationship between the Father and the Son, getting near the bottom of page 136, Bavink provides several scripture passages that tell us about this relationship. 
So for instance, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. So this is dealing with the eternality of that relationship, as Caleb was talking about. Having the form of God, Philippians 2, 6, so that equality. Uh, John 17, uh, verses 5 and, and verse 24, uh, talking about his glory that he had. The image of the Son being the image of the Father, so Hebrews 1, 3. And on it goes with several more texts describing the nature of this relationship. We also see things like the Son's role in creation, which... While not explicitly stated in the Old Testament, like the Father and the Spirit's work was, we see in texts like John 1, 3 and Colossians 1, 16, the Son's work in creation, and then add to that Hebrews 1, 3, his work of providence. That's also where the, uh, and that's the, to the point where I believe we had made uh, in it's either the last episode of the Trinity or the first episode on the Trinity, where even when we speak of the Apostles' Creed, to say, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, is already to confess the Trinity because of their relationship to one another economically. That the divine being is one. There are these specific persons, but all three persons are involved in the one work of making and of redemption, of creation and recreation. So I believe in God maker of heaven and earth. One of the harder questions, perhaps, that can be faced is uh, also the question of what about the Holy Spirit? How are we to understand the Holy Spirit? I believe Abraham Kuyper, in his uh, magnificent work um, titled The Work of the Holy Spirit, uh, starts off in pointing out the issue of the name Holy Spirit. The name God the Father tells us about uh, how are we are to understand this person of the Father as Father, and just as with the name uh, the Son, we understand the things of the Son. With this of God the Spirit, we have a question, uh, something of a vaguety or ambiguity to our natural understanding. What does it mean to be spirit? What is a spirit? I can't see my spirit. I, I don't quite understand my spirit. Uh, so how are we to make sense of God as spirit uh, or even perhaps in older translations or, or, or uh, Texas Receptus translations when we use the word ghost? This, this brings up all sorts of kind of strange thoughts about then what is uh, this third person of, this, of the Trinity? Um, and one of the best starting places is actually that first area of the third person's name, the Holy Spirit, so that he is Holy. However, Bob Inc., so this is proceeding from the break on the bottom of page 136, makes a distinction between God as spirit generally. So as we see, for instance, in John 4, 24, where God is spirit and those who will worship him will worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, and also God is holy. So for instance, Isaiah 6, 3, this does not mean that that all of God or all that is in God is the Holy Spirit. There is a distinction, a personal distinction between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, that, well, with that, you get then that question of what is this spirit? Well, as I said, what does spirit mean then? Um, if we're saying that God himself is spirit on the one hand, uh, of his essence as deity, he is invisible, without parts, uh, immaterial, and so on and so forth, uh, simple. To perceive the person of the Holy Spirit, we kind of end up with this, then this question of uh, what is personhood or what is a person. Well, Bobbing says uh, here, uh, something of a bit of a clue here, uh, just as in a comparative way of speaking, man is a spirit in his invisible nature and also possesses a spirit by means of which he is aware of himself and self-conscious. God is a spirit by nature and also possesses a spirit. A spirit which searches the depths of his being. As such, he references 1 Corinthians 2.11 there, but as such, the latter, uh, being the spirit which searches the depths of his being, is the spirit of God or the Holy Spirit. And this is that distinction then, which Andrew was speaking of, uh, of the distinction of a spirit of an angel or of a human spirit or of any other creature. Although he is distinguished from God, says Bovink, from the Father and the Son, 
He stands in the most intimate of relationships with both. He is called the breath of the Almighty, the breath of his mouth, which is a way to understand or translate the New Testament Greek for spirit, a way in which we we could understand this as something of a breath or wind, uh, the root of the word. Um, So you get little pictures like that in a manner, this breath or wind, uh, likewise in same meaning in the Old Testament usages. But he also is proceeds from both. The spirit is sent out by the father and the son says Bob Inc., citing the main passages of John 14, 26 and 15, 26. He proceeds from both and not just of the Father alone, but also of the Son, for he is also called the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of the Father. So what we get here is simply showing that this isn't just some kind of force. This isn't just some kind of thing or power, an impersonal thing. This is an actual person that can be named, that can be interacted with, that can be the object of uh, of various actions and originator of actions. Um, Just as example, you know, the passage that would say, or the verse that would say, uh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Would you say that typically of, say something like a, I have a lot of books around me, a book. Can you grieve a book? Can you grieve... Can you grieve an Apple? Uh, can you grieve uh, not a Mac, but because you would definitely say you can or a Mac can grieve you because uh, he's a PC user. Hey, man. Ill. But <laughs> so insert uh, insert commercial from 2008. Hi, I'm a Mac. I'm a PC. <laughs> Old reference. That's it. Yeah, Dated. we're dating ourselves. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Okay, anyways. <laughs> but yes, can, can you grieve a box or a chair. Okay. These are sometimes we do personify objects or things, but there's also an oddity at times. If we were to like, things would sound weird to our ears. Like if I said, my chair has power, my chair is truth or of truth. Okay. We don't attribute things like say the spirit of truth or giving titles like Holy spirit. This is, gives us a pretty big indication. If not, actually quite clear that the Holy Spirit is not a thing or an impersonal force, not just a gift of power or whatever, but a person of God. Right. And in fact, Bob Inc. lists several passages and several examples of personal characteristics being ascribed to the Spirit. So, for instance, selfhood in Acts 13, 2, the Spirit speaks... Uh, the spirit has self-consciousness, Acts fifteen twenty-eight. Uh, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us at the Jerusalem Council. Self-determination or will. Uh, all these who are in First Corinthians twelve eleven. All these who are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as He wills. Um, also investigating that searching we've talked about already. Listening, speaking, teaching, praying, and the like. And this comes out most clearly and sublimely, Bobbing says, in the fact that he is placed on one and the same level with the Father and the Son. So, of course, in the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, uh, verse 18 through 20, and then the benediction at the end of Second Corinthians, the Trinitarian blessing, where he is addressed the holy spirit is addressed along with the father and the son well, and that's all the time that we have uh for today we thank you for joining us uh we do hope that uh you learned something uh helpful amidst uh our rambling uh, especially mine today uh i'm just enthusiastic about the doctrine of the trinity um but uh if i have said any heresy then uh, make sure that you know you contact your nearest session uh or consistory for Good and decent order um, for my excommunication. Right, Andrew? Oh, sorry. I tuned you out. All that rambling. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, whatever he said, do that. (laughs) Well, we'll go ahead and see you next time. Until then, totesines. Totesines. Thank you for listening to Bobcast. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave a five-star review where you get your podcasts. For the latest Bobcast news and updates, visit bobcast.com 
or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Bobcast is a member of the Society of Reformed Podcasters. Subscribe to the Society of Reformed Podcasters feed to hear more great theological content. Music is City of God by Rudy Manrique. We hope you'll join us again next time.